Okay, so good morning. Um, what happened since last time? I've written up uh, properly all the stuff we did last time, and this will now help us to understand what we're doing today. Because as I promised, we will do a bit, uh, maybe we managed to get an auto encoder to run, let's see. So here is what we've done last time. We loaded our the usual data sets with this interferon alpha gamma receptor knockout, did all the usual pre-processing when we got the humor, but we know well by now with here the beginning of the lineage and here the end of the lineage. And then we did a local regression. And here I have this table for everything I need for my local regression with the pseudo time and with the counts and the total. And I will now here uh, regress the fraction of counts over total on this pseudo time. And just for a reminder, this is how our pseudo time looks like. It starts here with zero and ends with, with one somewhere here. And as you can see, there's something odd here that here the pseudo time goes a bit backwards. Uh, so the pseudo time algorithm and the UMAP algorithm were not exactly uh, agreeing on where the thing ends. Morning. And let's keep this in mind because we will see now a couple of times today that the end of our fits will always look a bit weird, which points us out that there's still something unresolved here. Now, uh, the thing that we did last time is that we simply plotted this fraction of counts for this specific gene, aquaporin 4, our astrocyte marker, against the pseudo time, and see, is, we see how the expression strength of aquaporin 4 is high at the beginning and goes down later. The standard trick that we did last time in order to make sure that we can see the zeros properly, uh, in our analysis so far, we always added a pseudo time fraction of 10 to the minus 4. Or what we actually did, we multiplied this fraction by 10 to the plus 4 and then added 1. But of course, on a log scale, this is just a shift. So we can also think about it as adding 10 to the minus 4. Here I've added 10 to the minus 5, so that this band here of all the zeros is doesn't sit up here in the middle of my plot. And uh, what we've also always done is I introduced this column jitter here at the beginning, which is just some random noise, which I use here to blow up the zero so that I can more easily see how many points are on top of each other here. And I do this simply using this Pmax function, which is the maximum of these two, because jitter is always lower than count over total because it's a 10 to the minus 5 and you see all the other values are above this works quite nicely. Now last time we tried different ways of smoothing this data so of getting a smooth curve through this thing and after trying around for quite a bit uh, we settled you might no not last time it's already a while ago here in that one we did this, where we tried, as you might remember, all these different ways of fitting our curve. And when we found here this way of making linear regression with a kernel weight. And in the end, what then proved to be very useful is to use generalized linear models, where we don't try to make a least square fit, but rather a fit which maximizes the likelihood of observing the data that we see if we take the data that our regression model predicts as the mean of a Poisson distribution. And uh, so this is what I've now done here. And as, when we did this three weeks ago, we did all this manually by just writing down the formulas uh, by hand. But of course, because this is such a common thing to do, there is a ready-made R function for this, which um, is this logfig package which we, I think, decided at the, discussed at the end. And here you see how logfit works. So logfit, you, de, uh, you uh, specify a formula in R's usual formula notation. So to the left of the tilde, the response variable, which is the number of counts that we get from the gene. To the right, uh, the predictor variable, the pseudo time. Uh, so the x and y axis here. And we make this what we call a local polynomial. It's just a special notation of a log fit package where we tell the pseudo time that we always want to put the pseudo time under a kernel and the width of this kernel should be adapted such that the support of the kernel always covers 20% of the whole uh, of, of all the points. And hence, depending on whether the pseudo time is 
uh, dense or not so dense, the kernel becomes wider or not so wide. Uh, here's our data table, which contains these columns. Then we have to specify for the fit function which likelihood function it used, and it uses the Poisson function. And importantly, if you use the Poisson function, unless you specify otherwise, this always implies that we are using the Poisson likelihood with its so-called canonical link. This is the logarithm, where it means uh, our likelihood is that the polynomial over the pseudotime doesn't directly fit fit the count, but it fits the logarithm of the count. Um, you might ask, yeah, how can this work? How can we fit the logarithm of the count if the count is zero? But of course, the fit is done the other way around. The polynomial, so the predicted thing is exponentiated. And when we exponentiate it, it never gives us zero. And when we ask what's the likelihood to see a zero under this exponentiated thing, that's why we can deal with the zeros now in a natural manner. Of course, what we really want to fit is not the count, but the count over total. And if I pull this through with a logarithm, this means I want to subtract this total. Uh, and this is why... Uh, mm, or on the other hand, in order to get to the counts, we have to take the prediction and multiply it by the total. And this is why we specify a base where we say, uh, once you've done the fit, add this content of this table total. But it's not a normal regression part because it's not multiplied by a regression coefficient, but it's added as is. That's why it doesn't appear here in the formula, but it appears in this special base argument. And importantly, you have to make clear that you use the, that it's the logarithm because the base is specified on the linear side of the GLM and not on the linked side. So you always have this, these two scales, the response scale and the linear scale, which are linked by the log function. Is this like the exposure? This is exactly, this is in, in many textbooks, which is not, is here Lockfit calls it the base. Other textbooks call it the offset, and others call it the exposure. The term exposure comes from the point that the most common case where you need this is you have uh, you want to calculate uh, incidence of, let's say you want to, to see the risk of work injuries, and you count the number of injuries per worker, and then, of course, you have to see about how long this worker was employed, so how long he was exposed to the risk. That's why we call it exposure, because usually we count bad things, because the whole math comes from epidemiology. So you always ask how long has each statistical unit been exposed to the risk of getting injured or breaking down in case it was equipment or something like this. Uh, as you remember, in this logarithmic local fitting procedure, uh, we... Um, uh, the procedure is that you then ask the fit for the y value for a given x value. So you have to tell the fit procedure for which, for which x values you want to fit the curve. And you pass this with this evaluate at argument. And I've just passed here a list of sequences of values from 0 to 1 split into 1,000 values. And if I do this, then I can get here this a tipple here with here my uh, grid of values from 0 to 1 in 0.001 things, and here the corresponding y values that uh, the fit gives me once I read out the fit's predict here with the predict function. And here's the, uh, here's the curve that we get in that way, and we see here how it goes down with aquaporine. And what we nicely see is that uh, the fit does a much better, uh, better uh, um, job than our usual uh, when, when our simple adding 10 to the minus 4 or adding 10 to the minus 6 of dealing here with these areas. So here it makes a proper average between the zeros and the non-zero value. And we can see that uh, aquaporine really steadily goes down and down and down. And only at the end there's a little wiggle. And as I've said before, my suspicion is that this wiggle is actually because the pseudotime runs backwards at the very end. And so it seems to go up again, but in reality, the pseudotime values seem to be inverted here in this last part. But I still haven't figured this out. I also moved this band here a little bit down. You see now it's at 10 to the minus 6 instead of 10 to the minus 5, just for more aesthetic things. What we also talked about last time is the deviance, where we said 
uh, we want to know how much this, uh, how well this Poisson variable here fits um, the curve. And what we can do is that we simply ask if uh, we sit at a certain pseudo time value, we expect our data to be Poisson distributed around this uh, right value here. And then we can ask what is the likelihood for the different count values and can ask for each actual value uh, how, what is the probability of getting this actual value given a Poisson distribution with a predicted mean. And if this probability is very small, so if the actually observed point is very far in the tails of the predicted, uh, of the, uh, predicted probability function, we may conclude that our fit is bad, that we don't have good, uh, decent goodness of fit. And so uh, this is a way to judge goodness of fit, as the statistics say in some strange abuse of English grammar. And uh, the goodness of fit, hence, is calculated by looking at the, uh, at the, at the uh, Poisson probability of observing the actually observed counts k, given the predicted uh, number lambda, where our prediction is, of course, the fitted curve times this total, because we have a space in there. And we want to, and we call this part here the log likelihood. And to have some comparison, we always compare the log likelihood with the log likelihood of a so-called saturated model, where we put here uh, the counts k here, and where you can see we have, uh, we ask what is the probability of observing k counts in a Poisson, which is exactly, has its mean exactly on k. Because this is, of course, the maximum we can get for the likelihood by simply putting the lambda parameter on the value of k. And the uh, difference between these four is called the deviance. And we multiply it by two uh, before calling it the deviance, because then if we en enter for f Poisson, if we go back to our uh, base case, the normal distribution, and put in here the, uh, the uh, probability density function of a normal, then, you know, in the normal, the log will bring down the stuff which's up in the exponent. In the exponent, we have uh, y minus mu squared over 2 sigma squared. And this 2 sigma squared, this 2, we want to cancel by this. So that in the end, what the deviance then is, is simply x minus mu squared over sigma squared which is typically called z squared, because we like to talk about the z value, which is um, simply, for a random variable, the uh, deviation of a variable from its expected value divided by the standard deviation. And the reason why I like to look at the z value is because uh, we all have an intuition what the z value is, namely, uh, because people typically have this rule here in your mind, that right? in a normal distribution, 68% uh, of the data has a z-value below 1, 95% a z-value between 2, and 99.7% a z-value between 3. So if your z-value is above 3, you have a 1 in 300 case. And hence, if you then look at your z-values, you might quickly tell, Oh, this is, uh, I see much z values above 3 much more often than only once in 300, only in 0.3% of the cases. So obviously my fit isn't good. And we can do this here by, and that's what I've done here. I calculate these z values by taking the square root of a deviance. And now here I made my color scale from dark red to plus dark red. So when the colors are saturated, this is, this means that the z-value is above 2, so the saturated colors we should only see in 5% of the cases, but we see it much more often. This is, of course, fully expected, because we assume, if we assume a Poisson likelihood, we basically say that the biological state of a cell is fully determined by the pseudotime, and all cells with the same pseudotime have the same expected expression strength of aquaporin 4. But of course, cells might differ in more than pseudotime. If we just look at this uh, picture here, uh, all this stuff here has more or less the same pseudotime, but we already see from the structure in it that there must be difference between this part and that part and that part, or here and here. So 
uh, there's good reason to expect that. And to get a better feeling of what's happening here, one approach would be to say, okay, let's recalculate the likelihood, but this time let's allow for a little bit of biological variation. Let's assume for plus minus 30% on variation on the expectation of a Poisson. And what we've also said last time is to do this, we can use a negative binomial. I've written down this formula once more that I put on the board last time, where we then said if the coefficient of variation of our counts is given by the Poisson, by this 1 over mu, but we can add some constant which just tells us how much coefficient of variation we expect from the biology, and we can put this into our likelihood by uh, making something like this here. We take our Poisson probability and say the, the rate of the Poisson probability is not fixed, but it is drawn from another probability which I call Fy, and I marginalize this out by calculating this integral. And it turns out that if you want to get a nice closed form solution of this integral, then you should use for Fy the gamma distribution, uh, because when you get, um, no? where is it? Uh, because when, as you can see here, if you put the Poisson and the gamma in here, when you end up with this closed form solution, which is called the gamma Poisson distribution or the negative binomial distribution. Uh, and I've done this. I went in now with a with a coefficient of variation of plus minus 30 percent in this and replaced in my calculation for the deviance the Poisson now by the negative binomial where you have to, to give your rate as the parameter mu and with, gum, with plus minus 30 percent we have to give as the parameter size but size isn't gamma directly but it's one over gamma squared for reasons which become apparent if you try to look through all this math here. Uh, so let's not do that and just believe it. And if I do this, we can now see here that, we, uh, that the gray area of good fit has become wider because we are now more tolerant, at least for the highly expressed genes. For the lowly expressed genes, the width of the gray area shouldn't have changed much because in this area, Poisson noise dominates and only up there here, uh, we really see an effect of this biological variation. Uh, so it didn't make that much difference. Even with 30% plus minus noise, we still see a lot of uh, high uh, deviance residuals, which tells us that actually, yes, there's a lot of extra noise in here. Now, if we have all this extra noise, we could uh, conclude uh, we now have to remember why we wanted to do the smoothing. And there's two reasons why you might want to do smoothing, as I've said here. Uh, we could either ask, what is the influence of one specific con uh, covariate on it? And that's one way of saying this. We want to know what does Poisson, what does pseudotime, how does aquaporin depend on pseudotime? And we are fully aware that the aquaporin expression depends not only on pseudotime, but we want to see the dependence on pseudotime. For this, this is, of course, the right way to go. Another reason why we want to do smoothing is to denoise our data. We want to get rid of a Poisson noise, but keep all the other, uh, but keep all the biological stuff. And to this end, we might say, uh, let's average over all those cells which seem to be in the same biological state. And averaging, and here in this moving, we effectively average over the pseudotime, or was, we average over all those cells with the same pseudotime, which is a start, but it's not good enough because, of course, there's more that determines the states, uh, the cell state than the pseudotime. So what we want is to have a, to have some way of determining the cell state precisely so that we can say these two cells are in more or less the same state, so averaging over them should make our biological signal crisper while averaging out the Poisson noise. And obviously the best thing we have in this effect is our principal component positions. We 
we have done at the beginning, we took our expression and brought it down to this principal component and have said this 30 PC coordinates are hopefully a good way of doing this thing. And this is why also I think we've already briefly went over this uh, last time where we said, let's just do nearest neighbors moving. For each cell, let's take the 30 nearest neighbors where we've already calculated earlier for our clustering and for our UMAP and use this 30 and just take the average over these 30 Things. And as we've also seen, the best way to do this is to add up the counts and add up the totals and then divide them. And here's now how our plot now looks like. Here each the y coordinate, the curve is the same as before, but the y coordinates are now the sum of the 30 of the aquaporine expression counts of the 30 nearest neighbor divided by the sum of the totals of these 30 nearest neighbors. And if you compare this to the previous curve, this one here, you see if we take only our raw data, we can't get much below 10 to the minus 4 simply because after all we always add plus 10 to the minus 4 and so dilute out everything which is smaller than that. Um, here I've now, instead of adding 10 to the minus 4, I've added, if you look at here, you see I just calculated the sum of this divided the sum of the totals, and then I added a noise floor around 10 to the minus 6, this thing here. So that now I can see uh, the values going much further down, and it seems to follow, it seems to describe the value now nicely for these intermediate pseudo times where before simply everything was zero. Even though it still looks like the curve is a bit above this data. So that's not quite perfect. And the one argument I said last time is we should do the same that we also did at the local fitting where we also started at sitting at one position and taking uh, and just averaging over everything under the kernel. And then later we said, instead of just averaging under the kernel, we should, where was this plot here? We should make a regression under the kernel in order to be able to see whether at this point in the direction things going up or going down or something like that. And this is what we can do uh, by looking at the PCA. And... Uh, that's what we do next. Maybe before ah, this is what I have added here and haven't shown you yet this last time because it somehow didn't work. Uh, here is again the expression of aquaporin 4, each cell shown by itself. And so you see this what we call salt and pepper, pepper pattern, where you see individual green dots among a yellow sea. And you don't quite know, is this something real or is this just a random fluctuation? And if I now have done my smoothing, over the, uh, uh, my smoothing over the neighbors, this uh, salt and pepper pattern turns into something more smooth, which seems maybe might be more uh, agreeable and gives us a better picture of what's happening here. Here I also calculated the deviance residuals, again with this 30% uh, uh, with this 30% plus minus of a Poisson, and we can see which points now seem to be outside the likelihood, the probability distribution of this neighborhood smoothing, which is a useful thing to do because for each cell I calculated the ex expected expression strength from averaging over its 30 neighbors, and then I can compare this with the actual expression strength observed by the at the specific cell and I can judge the deviance between the two by comparing it with how much difference I would expect according to a negative binomial, which is this 30% biological noise that I put here plus the Poisson noise. And yeah, that's what you get. So most of the stuff is gray, but there's occasionally blue and red points sticking out. And then the last thing that we did here is that instead of smoothing, of simply taking the neighborhood, we smooth along the PCA. And there we can do this useful thing that we've also done already long ago. Um, when we looked at the principal components, we talked about the fact 
that in a PCA we can draw forward and backwards. We take our PCA rotates everything into a basis where the interesting dimension are in front, and when we kick out the remaining dimension, which we assume only contains Poisson noise anyway, and what we can do is rotate back to, uh, uh, to the original feature space, and when we rotate back, when we get, of course, for each gene new values, which are hopefully now cleaned from the Poisson noise, and the cleaning has happened that now, of course, we, uh, after we rotate back, what we calculate for the, for, the, uh, for the gene is not only this gene's own expression, but it's more a linear combination over many genes which are strongly correlated with a gene of interest. And that's what I do here when I take this... Um, When I, uh, so where have I put this here? When I unrotate this here, we have our rotated PCR A coordinates already truncated to only 30 dimensions. And I invert my rotation matrix so that this is the PCA rotated back to feature space. And then, of course, because before doing the PCA, I had subtracted all the means of the genes and the PCA function stored the subtracted means in the center part. I add them back, and if I add them back, I get my PCA smooth data. And the PCA smooth data looks, of course, a little bit different from uh, what we had before. I should probably have put that one in, that we can use this uh, PCA smooth data, expression smoothed. I hope it's loaded in the other window, then I can quickly show you this. Here is the smoothed expression. And here is the raw expression, L frax AQP4. So this is the expression that we got from each cell's individual, and this is after rotating into PCA space and rotating back, and by this manner, mixing in some information from the others. And what you now get is something like this here, where you see a lot of cells which have zero counts, but after rotating back, we see quite an appreciable uh, AQP4 expression, where essentially the PCA said, judging from all the other stuff that was close to it, this cell here should have had a high expression of, um, this gene should have had a high expression, even though we've seen zero expression. And so by this, uh, this rotating back brings us a lot of, maybe I make extra thing, and in, and in a PCA is dot, and in a way it now shows us some interesting bimodality that we haven't seen before. If we look at this here, and only the, the fractions like this, this, then you see it's rather uh, hard to say whether this is an extra mode, but if I look at the PCA smooth data, when I see a clear bimodality with stuff either be, uh, being above 0.1 or being be below 1, with this being the cells which express aquaporin strongly in which those which don't. And this is how PCA smoothing helps us. This and again, what has happened here is that we have mixed in data from the other genes in order to improve our expression strength of a PCA. And hence, this bimodality now causes that we see here this clear break. This is sort of a right-hand mode, and this is the left-hand mode, and these are the intermediate things. And again, we can ask, is this now, by mixing in the data from the other genes, have we maybe made more, uh, more uh, uh, destroyed more than we improved by looking at the deviances and check at which part do we have strong deviances which indicate that the true expression is probably more than 30% away from the PCA exp smoothed expression. And that's 
what I've done here by again calculating the deviance, the same formula as before, now putting in my PCA predicted stuff. What I've also done here is the last thing is that I plotted the PCA predicted data. And if we go back to this year, here you see our smoothed expression. And uh, of course, this scale here is now on the natural log scale. And on the other, it was on the log 10 scale. So let me quickly uh, change this. And now you can see here, these are the zeros. And of course, this left-hand peak, it cannot go below 10 to the minus 4. It already stops sort of here at zero. And What I now want to do is um, I want to run our PCA, but this time you remember originally when we calculated the PCA, we uh, noticed or we uh, convinced ourselves that you can solve the PCA problem by an eigenvalue decomposition. Now we assume that we don't know much about linear algebra, didn't realize that it's an eigenvalue decomposition, so we brute force it. We just say, we want to minimize the reconstruction error with a, with a uh, mean square loss, and then we run a general purpose optimizer in order to get this. And the point of this is that we will notice that it takes much longer than before, but because it's now general, we can simply replace our loss with something else, like a, G, like a Poisson loss. And then we get the same advantage that we had before, where in our fit against the pseudo time, we were able to dip much below 10 to the minus 4 and treat the zeros properly, because we knew the minus, uh, we properly uh, looked at this uh, loss. So let's see if I manage this. So here I've loaded my data. And as you can see, we have, as usual, 18,000 cells, 20,000 genes. Um, I switch this from a sparse to a dense array. 
just quickly, I don't, so that I don't have to look up how to work the sparse data on uh, SciPy. I calculate my totals. Here, this is how you calculate row sums in, uh, in NumPy by saying make a sum over axis one. Remember, we are in Python now. In Python, everything is zero based. So the rows are called axis zero. The columns are called axis one. We defined, so we divide the, frac the counts by these totals to get the fractions, also as we've also done. You remember in R, we always needed to do this annoying transpose and transpose back. And uh, NumPy has a nicer way of doing it. You can write this comma none to say, expand the vector totals to a matrix by saying the elements are the rows and add a sort of nothing uh, dimension here. And depending on whether you write colon comma none or none comma colon, you either divide by the columns or by the rows. So it's quite convenient. I take the fractions times 10 to the 4 and add one. Remember, log 1p means log 1 plus. And now I get my log fractions. Next thing is I calculate the, uh, the uh, means for the highly variable genes. As you may or may not remember from earlier this term, we said we do this always before taking the log. So it says here frax and not L frax. And I calculate here this time across axis zero, so I get the means and axis per gene, and I get this picture that you might remember from the beginning where we always saw here when each dot is a gene, and now I take the top 1500 of these genes here as my highly variable genes. This is exactly the same I also did here in R, so I should get exactly the same cells. And where was I? Here. And here we go. Uh, so the arc sort, which is the same as which mean in the other case, I go them. Now I, I take from my logarithmized fractions, and remember these are the fractions with this 10 to the minus 4. Uh, added, I take out uh, only those rows corresponding to these highly variable genes and calculate a PCA. And it should give us the same PCA as before. And I checked this by looking here at the, um, at the uh, scatter plot of the explained variance, and then went over to R Studio and also calculated, looked at the explained variance. So in R, I have this PCA dollar S def. In Python, it was explained variance here at standard deviation, so I have to square it, and if I plot that, you see here down, little kink down again. Very roughly, you can see this is the same plot. <laughs> so uh, I did this a couple of times to make sure that my Python R really does the same thing. So I had a bit of closer look, and yes, it's the same thing. I can also calculate a UMAP. It works the same as in R. I say neighbors and mindest are nearly the same. You have to do this two-step thing where you first make the UMAP function and then call fit on it. Uh, takes a minute or so, and once it does, it gives me this UMAP plot which looks the same as our UMAP plot uh, that we had here. Only, as always, you know, in UMAP, things always rotate a bit every time you look at them. And here we have now this. So, and of course, we can look at Aquaporin 4. As I said, I was too lazy to run the gene names. This is why it says here 8818, which is where Aquaporin 4 sits. And we get see here again the stem cells and a lineage over there. And now I want to calculate the PCA that we just had, and I want to calculate it again, this time using brute force optimization. So let's try this. And for my optimization, I use the PyTorch framework. PyTorch is a framework developed to do neural networks on Python. And as you know, neural networks is all about running optimizers around connections of many matrices or tensors. So it's, it's, it has all the functionalities that we want. What we do here is first we need our data. And I call the data so y full. I called it y full because I later wanted to subset to only a couple of cells. So full means all cells. I think I haven't even done that. And so I take my fractions here only for the variable genes, because I want to redo what the PCA done. And the PCA automatically subtracts the means. Here I do this manually. I calculate the means per genes and subtract them. 
and get now here a matrix. And this matrix I turn into a tensor. A tensor is a uh, linear operator. Uh, the tensor is basically, in the easiest case, it is a uh, generalization of a matrix. So in the parlance of the two definitions of the term tensor, in physics we say a tensor is what transforms like a tensor, which is a definition that causes lots of frustration to all undergrad physics students. The whole point of a graduation, you only understand at the end of the term. But as we don't do physics, I don't have to explain to you this enigma now, what we physicists mean by this. In numerics, what we consider a tensor is any kind of uh, data structure is an n-dimensional array, so a matrix is one kind of array. So essentially a, a data structure with several indices. For example, for example, we might have a tensor A with indexes i, j, k, and we might have a tensor B with indexes i and k. So this is just a three-dimensional array of numbers. This is a two-dimensional array of numbers. And if we now assume that the dimension, the first dimension here and here has is both 20 numbers, and the, first, and the dimensions labeled k is also the same in both, I can make a, uh, I can make a double sum running i and k over these values. As again, this only works if i has the same number of elements here and here. And if I do this, I get a new tensor, which now has only the one thing left, j here. As you can see, this is a special case. If a matrix multiplication is a special case of this. If I have a matrix m i j, and I have another matrix n i j l and I add over j when I get an um, m n i l. So this is what we call a contraction. We have two tensors which share some index we add over these indices and when the index vanishes and a matrix matrix multiplication is one case of contraction but of course you can contract over other stuff. And, uh, and, in, um, and the whole point of tensors in numerics that often you notice that this matrix vector can, uh, form uh, is a bit too restrictive. You want to have more than two indices and you still want to do the same thing of contracting over them. So when the, when the neural network people like to talk about tensors, what they always mean is I arrange my data in constructs like this such that it is easy to construct. There is then a function in Torch, which is called tensor dot, which does a tensor contraction. You give it this tensor, and you give it that tensor, and then say, please run the construction sum such that the sum runs over, you can either say it over i and k, but because, of course, you don't name the indices, because you trust if it's, you say, please run the construct, con also this here is a contraction with, over the indices 0, 0, and 2, 1. Why? Because the index 0 of the first tensor and the index 0 of the second tensor is contracted over, and the index, so this is 0, 1, 2, and this is 0, 1. And this index 0, 0 is contracted over, and 2, 1 is contracted over. Of course, you can all, and in this way, you can see the matrix multiplication as a special case. A useful side effect with always annoying having to transpose matrices and back then vanishes because instead of transposing, you just always think about which tensor, which indices actually uh, belong to each other and then you specify this there. So this is the tensor way of doing linear algebra. And because we want to use this, we now move this uh, we now say, please make this matrix to a tensor. And now we have this tensor. In the same way, we take our PCA components, the PCA rotation, we also turn into a tensor. So here you can now see how my full matrix, my Y full data looks like. It just tells me it's a tensor with two dimensions. 
And yeah, so it's essentially a matrix. And of course, I can now calculate my tensor of a full things by uh, uh, here I've written it as a matrix multiplication. If you now want to rotate with, uh, if I now want to try out uh, to recalculate what the PCA just then, I can do my PCA, which is the rotation matrix of the PCA times the data matrix. And I use this add sign here, which is a matrix multiplication. And I compare this with what the PCA has calculated us as its PCA score matrix, and I get the same. So as expected, data matrix times, no, rotation matrix times data matrix gives PC score matrix. From what I've just told you here, uh, instead of making all these transposes, I could, of course, also have set here torch.tensor dot uh, said, okay, I want to rotate PCA rot and Y full. And now I would here think at it and say, and the dimensions, I would now, and I think, I hope I do this right, I would now specify that it should rotate. Let's see here, PCA full. Ah, it in the beginning, ah, yes. And now let's see, we have um, below PCA rod dot shape. This is 20 times 1500. 1500 are the genes, that's the index one. And the other one is Y full dot shape. So you see here, I want to I want to contract over these indices because they uh, belong to each other. 1500, 1500. So I tell this thing, contract this, the second or number one because we start counting by zero. So contract one with one. And uh, must be a tuple of ints, not int. I think I have to make it like this. Not enough values to unpack. One comma, or was it like this? I think it was, yes, exactly. This is how you do this in tensor notation, where I now said, oh, yeah, okay, I made this wrong. I said uh, 0, 0, 0,2, 0, 0,1. So I say, so this is now um, I, I, and this would be K, K. So that's how you write it. First, we indices in the first tensor, then we indices in the second tensor. And so I get this thing out, only now it's not transposed, because here I've transposed the whole thing back, and here I haven't. But in the end, you see, this is just now written my PCA the same way as before. And what we now want to do is, we want to find our own rotation matrix by making, so in, if we want to get this PCA rotation matrix, not by using the PCA function, but by using general optimization. So that's in order to do this, I first here, I take this thing that I've just done uh, and make the reconstruction. So I take here, this here is the PCA matrix. And then I multiply the PCA matrix again with a rotation to rotate back. So here I've rotated forward, projected in the feature space, rotated back. And in this case, this is my reconstructed uh, expression data. So exactly what I've done before here in my smoothing where I said, I take my data matrix, move it into PCA space, move it back to feature space, and now I get something which is hopefully reconstructed it well. I can make the plot that we've just made before here, this one, where, uh, where is it here, where we plotted the raw data for Aquaporin 4 against the PCA smooth data by taking here, as you see, this is the same plot, where on the x-axis I take the raw data, which I called Y full, and here I take the reconstructed data, which I called Y hat. Uh, for those who are not familiar with statistics notation, the statisticians like to always put a hat on fitted data. 
And by head, I mean the circumflex thing on top of it. And yeah, and here with dot numpy is to move the tensors back into the realm of numpy so that we can give it to scatter plot. So you always will have to move things from numpy to tensor space back and forth. And we see this thing. And what I now want to do is how good is this construction? So I take here my y full and my y hat and I look at the difference between the two and I square them and I sum this all up. And what I now see is my PCA loss. So this is the overall loss. Maybe if I now think about it, what might be more interpretable is to not take the sum but the mean. And you see my, piece, my loss is 0.35 on average for each data point. And what we will now do is we try to find a rotation matrix which goes below this loss. So let's first try this. Let's do this rotation matrix, copy it into matrix R, and change one of the elements. So here the elements 2, 2 in this PCA matrix I just uh, um, mess up by adding 0.1. And if I do this, and now I recalculate my y hat with my new messed up rotation matrix and recalculate the loss, then we now see uh, that what's happened now? Y hat again zone minus six. What has happened? Everything got perfect. I don't understand why. Ah. Why does it say here r dot transpose dot r? Isn't this what I've done here? Dot y full transpose. Move. I don't get it. Here is my y hat. Here is my scatter plot. Here is the PCA loss. Here a now keep the you copy the R matrix and now calculate this loss here and get the, uh, let me quickly try to debug this by taking this Y hat matrix here, trying this out, uh, I still have this loss here, loss R ah, of course. Uh, I'm an idiot. Uh, yeah. Loss dot item. That's what I wanted here. So here we see uh, we calculate our R. Then we get our um, and then now of course I get the same loss as before. But if I now twiddle with the R then my loss gets a, slight, a little bit different. And in order to see how much is different, I subtract the loss I had before. So uh, one Swiss, and here the old loss, I changed R, the new loss, and um, we see the new loss goes now up a little bit. Maybe I should have made a bit more drastic change here to really see some difference in mean loss. So this is how this now works. And what I now do next is uh, I want to see how can I undo this thing. And now comes the magic of this torch package. It allows for automatic differentiation. So watch what's happening now. I make here my PCA matrix. I make a little change. And now I sell, I require a gradient for R. And then I again do my calculation. I calculate Y hat and I calculate the loss. And then I say loss dot backwards. And then I can look at the gradient of R. So what has happened now is the following. By saying that I need a gradient of R, um, Torch will now keep track of all subsequent calculations which involve the tensor R and always calculate the gradient of this respect to it. And if I now here say loss dot backwards, oh. it goes backwards from loss and oh. asks how does loss depend on R? And what I then get here is this matrix here 
which is the matrix of derivatives of loss with respect to each element of R. And this is something uh, which is incredibly powerful because for every, if we, we have some tensor of lots of elements and we calculate from this tensor some other quantity like this loss here, which is just my mean squared error. And then I later can ask how does this mean squared error depend on each individual element of a loss. So in a way I have here my loss is some function of, uh, of R and maybe other things. And I can calculate the derivative of loss with respect to each element of R. And um, the way how this works is because I told it that I will later need the gradients with respect of R. So whenever I do any calculation which involves R, it now will build a graph or a calculation tree which tells me for each new thing. So it will store how y hat is connected to r over which calculations. And it will calculate how long and it will mark y hat as also a, a, a tensor which needs a gradient. And then loss is also a tensor which needs a gradient. So this needs gradient uh, uh, property is contagious, everything which is calculated from a tensor that needs a gradient will have this thing, which always instruct charge to whenever you do something with this thing. Uh, keep the information that you need, keep the information in the resulting tensor so that you can later calculate the gradient of the backwards calculation. And the backwards thing says, go backwards from loss to all the so-called leaf tensors. So, R is a leaf tensor because I gave it a value and then said I want a gradient. And it has now made this internal thing where it says uh, Y loss, Y hat depends on R and loss depends on Y hat. And if I say loss dot backwards, it moves along this graph backwards. So while I went my forward calculation, Torch kept built up this graph of how each tensor depends on each other thing. And then I can take one thing and say loss dot backwards, and then it will run these things backwards and populate the gradients of this thing so that it can later read out the gradient of R or the gradient of Y hat, where we have to be careful we say, we ask for the gradient of R, but what in reality get, we get the gradient of loss with respect to R. So we always get the gradient of the thing for which we call backwards with respect to the tensor for which we call grad. What does this now help us? Here we can now see the gradient. And in fact, you see, we messed with this 2, 2 element, which is this element here. And as you can see, this also has the highest gradient. So we can see if we now wanted to undo what we messed up, we would have to change that thing. And so let's see all the others now also have a gradient because of course, because R appears twice in here, there's a lot of chain rule happening, which uh, it does this. And I can now use this uh, to get back to, to reconstruct my loss and get back to my actual original loss. And what I do for this is this here. I calculate forward here, you see y hat and the loss, and then I print the loss, and I tell it to calculate the gradient, and then I say, take, the ra take my matrix R and subtract its own gradient. So what we do is called gradient descent, uh, where it means Whenever we want, a, we have a, we want to minimize the loss, and we say uh, if this is the loss, and this is one element of R, maybe R element two two, then we know that it probably looks like this. And at the beginning, our loss was optimal because that's what the PCA does. And when we added plus point one here. 0.01 and the thing went up and if I calculate now the gradient it will of course point in this direction. So if I subtract the gradient I go that way. 
but I shouldn't subtract the gradient as is because I will only end up here. I have to subtract this, the gradient times a small number so that I end here and the next time I calculate the gradient I will go here and in this way I descend along the gradient. And that's called gradient descent and it's all uh, it's how we usually do numerical optimization. Of course, this only works if we are not in, if we are not in a local minimum. Imagine we would sta start here when our gradient descent would leave us here to this local minimum. We wouldn't reach a global minimum. But uh, here now we are close enough to a global minimum because we went a little step away. A critical question is the learning rate. What number should I multiply the gradient in order to make sure that I don't overshoot and end up on the other end? This problem here is convex. The PCA, I think you can prove that it's convex. Oh, actually, no, I'm not sure. I think it's not a convex problem. Um, so, so this is what I now do here. And here you see I calculate this. And you see here my gradient. First it goes down and down, but from the first step, the loss actually goes up instead of down. So my learning rate was definitely too high, even though I put here so many zeros. So let's add a few, two more zeros and try this. Uh, stop. I need to reclone my R here. And you see with this learning rate, it now works, but we get slower and slower. So <clears throat> getting the right learning rate is a bit the whole art in this gradient descent. And you can do a lot of trial and error. Uh, and you will notice that maybe with the learning rate, you can't say one size fits it all. Maybe some, learn, some components of a gradient should have a higher learning rate and others should have a lower. And over the... 90s, a lot of thought has gone into this, and people came up with adaptive gradient descent things. And what we will now use is, the, uh, is something called the Adam method for stochastic optimization, which is, as you can see, a paper from 2014, and this has now become the state of the art. Uh, so here. Instead of now here doing my gradient myself, I leave it to this so-called optimizer. An optimizer in torch language is a piece of, is a function which uh, automatically decides on your gradient steps. So that's what we do here. I try it again. I take my, I put R here on this, I calculate R to be here a tensor made for my PCA components. I distort it a bit by adding two, say that I want the gradient. And now I tell the optimizer, please watch over this R because I want to optimize it. What you then do, you have to tell the optimizer first to zero the gradient. That's something I've done here as well. Because whenever you call loss, it goes backwards through this tree and adds up a chain rule uh, things in the gradients of the involved tensors. And because a tensor might appear several times in this network, in our case, for example, it does because uh, we have, uh, we have a y hat uses this twice because there is also r dot t. At some point, we make a transpose. And so uh, it could be that a tensor appears twice, and this way uh, a tensor always adds up the gradients it sees there. Yeah? And uh, hence, before you call loss, you have to zero all the gradients by calling grad zero on each of the objects here. Here now I tell the optimizer to zero all the, the gradients of all the uh, uh, parameters I gave it here to watch over. Now I do my calculation. I calculate y hat by doing uh, by data rotate and rotate back. Then I calculate my loss by calculating the mean squared error. When I print the loss here, maybe I put it again on mean instead of sum to see it more easily. Then I tell a loss to go backwards. Now I simply call opt step. Opt step means I have just called loss backwards on my loss function 
So the gradient should have accumulated in this thing which I have done here. Look into these things and find the effective learning rates to go there. And let's see what's happening now. And as you can see, our Adam does a quite a good job of uh, optimizing things here. We start with, it first makes here a very small step. So here I calculated the initial PC. Let, let, let me move this for first. Uh, try. So here you see it first tries a very small step. When it tries bigger steps, sometimes it even oversteps and notices how the loss goes up. When the next loop iteration, it will undo this overstepping and try a smaller and so on. And in the end, it does a good job of getting down. What it doesn't have is the convergence criterion. So at the end, it will just wiggle and, uh, and jitter back and forth a bit here in the minimum. Uh, that's because in all these neural networks, you never really get to think anyway. If you now look at this here, uh, still it takes a while. If I really want to go down and go down here, maybe to a number of thousand, you see here, pop, right. this is somehow uh, one number, uh, five numbers per second is too slow for us. Luckily, this is a computer uh, with a big GPU. So one of his typical gaming GPUs. And, hmm? um, Media SMI, it has a, where does it say here, V100. It's a, a Denby cluster. So. I looked it up, this is somehow in the 700 euro range, this thing. The point of a GPU is not only, uh, this GPU is not to run computer games fast, but the point of this GPU is to run tensor multiplications fast. So uh, I use the CUDA system. CUDA is a framework to, to uh, operate GPUs. And uh, by calling the CUDA function, it means move this data from the uh, from uh, the CPU to the GPU. At the moment, you see the CPU here is empty. It only has here a little bit graphics memory for the actual uh, graphic, which isn't right, which nobody's looking at because the computer is standing in some server room. But now I will tell us it to move our data onto this thing. And now, if we look here, we see that now it has moved. 958 megabytes onto the GPU. And the upshot of the thing is, if you see, this is the same code I had up here, only I added here a dot CUDA and I added here dot CUDA to move all the, uh, all the stuff to the CUDA things. And if I do this now, I stick to the mean, uh, you see it runs much faster. And because it now runs much faster, we quickly get with our loss below the PCA loss. So the PCI hasn't really optimized it. There seems to be a little bit round for improvement, which is probably just due to rounding errors, which why the loss after I subtract the PCA loss can actually get negative. So, and now, of course, what I've done so far is I used the result from PCA and I just made a little distortion to that, which doesn't, uh, isn't really useful. What we rather want to do is we use the PCA. We, uh, so here, if you look at this data, I took the, I, my matrix R, which I'm optimizing over, I took from the PCA component. Now for the next try, so, I put the code always one after the other, but I, from each code block to the next, I always only change one chunk. So uh, it's a bit bad that you can't see this now, but what I will now change is at the moment we have this code block. Let's look again. We move the data to the CPU. We construct our piece, our rotation matrix, which we want to get, uh, initialize it with a PCA result, twi tweak it a little bit, distort it a little bit, and then we run the optimizer to run 250 loops of always calculating the reconstructed data, calculating the mean squared error between the reconstructed data and the original data. And 
you run our and subtract the M2 a gradient descent step to go back to this one. That's what we do at the moment. And what I will now change is that instead of initializing R with a solution, which is of course a bit cheating, I initialize R with random values. Which brings us now back to uh, Philip's question about whether with a convex problem, because if it is a convex problem, then, then no matter where we start, we should add up and end up in the same minimum. So let's try this. Here, well, I. Don't yes, there exactly. Yeah, we don't enforce orthogonality in R, and we don't enforce. Uh, maybe we get a bit of orthogonality. We can actually look at this later. But now I just take here this randomness, tell it make a 20 by 1500 matrix out of standard normal random numbers and run the thing with that. Uh, I've tried a bit and noticed that uh, the random number is uh, that I should not make too big numbers for the beginning or it will jump all over. So I make my standard normal and multiply it by 0.03. I do this with this no grad decorator to tell it that it shouldn't register with multiplying by 0.03 as a, as a part of a gradient calculation. Strictly speaking, I, this wouldn't have been necessary because I zero the gradient here anyway. So if it had calculated, stored the gradient of this, it would have zeroed it out here again. But it complained somehow, so I added this. Otherwise, the rest of this data is the same. And now, we can stop. Let me fix this. Uh, here, I wanted to always use the mean. And, and I compare with the loss of the PCA. I do here 3,000 steps, and you see it only prints now every 100 step compared to before. So this is now the mean at the beginning with our random stuff. After 100, we are up to 0 0.01 close to the PCA loss. And actually, let me improve this a bit by plotting for you both the, piece, the full loss and the difference to the PCA. Now you see here the full loss just with random number is 0 0.65. And now we go down to 0 0.36, which is just a little bit above this. And if I wait after uh, 3,000 things or so, I should have actually got a good deal below the PCA. Now you see we've nearly reached PCA loss. Point, there are only point, uh, 10 to the minus 5 away from the PCA loss. So actually, we managed to get back to the result of the PCA from starting from random numbers, just using gradient descent. The rotation matrix now does work as well as the original matrix. Whether it's still an orthonormal matrix is questionable. But uh, it does the job of reconstruction and denoising the data as good as does the PCA. So we can quickly check whether it's actually uh, how awful normal it is. So here I've interrupted now. Let's see, we have here is our torch. And I to see whether it's awful normal, I have to multiply it with its transpose, right? Uh, of arguments, but uh, why can't I call transpose all right? Because the transpose function in in torch actually wants to know which axis I transpose. Because I mean, in a matrix, is clear it's first versus second. But here, because it could have more, I have to explicitly say this. And now we see it actually looks reasonable or for normal. Nevertheless, this here, this here, this here. As you can see, you always have nearly one of these. So even before we started with random numbers, we got back to an orthonormal matrix because uh, we, uh, because simply the solution to the optimization problem is to find an orthonormal. If it weren't orthonormal, then we could improve the loss further by making orthonormal. 
So, uh, clear cell output. And now, of course, now that we found that we can do the PCA using this brute force optimization, um, we can now change the loss function. Of course, because if we used a mean squared loss, the whole thing would be a waste of time because we've seen that an eigen decomposition is way faster than the other thing. But now let's try a new loss function. And my new loss function will be this loss function here, where I use uh, the Poisson loss. So to get the Poisson loss, let's first calculate the loss function with the PCA result. Because I will need it for this one, I now don't want to use the stupid 10 to a minus 4, so instead I calculate, I put my counts and my totals into new values which I call K and S. And I call the gene means as before and do my PCA rotation and calculate here I have my y hat as I had it. And now let's say we use this y hat for a Poisson thing, as we've done it before when we calculated this loss. So what I do is I take the y hat, the reconstruction, I add the gene means. And now I want, I have to undo my log normalization. So I exponentiate this and, multi and divide it by 10 to the 4. And I multiply it with the totals. And what I now get is the expected actual count value, which I call lambda. And here to check whether this has worked, on the x-axis you see the counts that I get for aquaporin 4 again. And on the y-axis you get the predicted counts. So my reconstructed Poisson, my reconstructed PCA denoise data re-exponentiated to the natural scale and multiplied with the total of the respective cell. And as you see, it sort of correlates quite well, even for it seems that in general our number is always a bit too low. If you look here, this is 10, 10, so we tend to underestimate things a bit. So here is my lambda, where I have written twice, doesn't quite matter. And now as my new loss function, I take the Poisson loss. Let's have a look at the Poisson probability mass function. Here's a Poisson distribution. And I want to calculate a loss function from this probability mass function. We take the log likelihood. So we take the log of lambda to the k f, f plus from k comma lambda is where is it? Lambda to the k times e to the minus lambda over k factorial. Now my log likelihood as a function of uh, lambda is log f plus k comma lambda. And I take the logarithm. This is k log lambda minus lambda minus log k factorial. This here doesn't depend on lambda, so I don't need it because k doesn't change. And I'm interested in, later I will be interested in the derivative of, of my log, of my, uh, log likelihood with respect to my matrix R. And we will, internally this will be calculated via chain rule as the derivative of a log likelihood with respect to lambda times the derivative of lambda with respect to r. So this thing will vanish because it can't influence the gradient because it doesn't contain anything de dependent on it. This is why here I now said my loss function is k times log lambda minus lambda. And again, it's written with the sum, but I want the mean. And now we see that with this, our like log likelihood per number is 5.45. Um, so again, to make this, to judge whether this is a lot or not, I should re subtract the saturated model. So I should do something like log F plus k 
k lambda minus log f plus lambda kk. This is the deviance. But that part we don't need because it depends only on k. So in order to make the number interpretable to us, so when we print it, it might be useful to subtract this, uh, this thing because then we know this is the maximum we can get. But to run the optimizer, we shouldn't bother our computer calculating this thing every time because it doesn't change anyway because our data is fixed. So that's what we now do. We calculate this new loss function and now we take the same code that we just always had and replace the loss function. So with the code we had before. Our full data, um, actually this I don't need. I take my, uh, I start off with a randomly initialized matrix. Here this matrix R, which I want to use with 20 by 1500, I make it, I initialize it with random numbers with standard deviation 0.03. I initialize my optimizer and tell it what all this matrix are because that's what I want to optimize. And now my optimization loop is as before with zero gradient. We call Y hat by taking Y full, uh, putting it into R and back. And now we try to find an R such that we get a good result by telling R, take these things and, and uh, calculate lambda from that and from lambda the Poisson loss. If I now run this, then I see how I get down and down and down with the Poisson loss. And I get quite a reasonable, let me calculate the loss, not as sum, but as mean, and we have a better feeling of what's going on here. Yeah, 4, 3, minus 5, minus 6, minus 7, minus 8. Let's go on a bit and let's maybe run it up to 1,000 or something so that we get a decent fit. Eight seven eight one. What did I say here? I let it run to 1500. Okay, let's go for it for 1500. And now, if you compare, this is what will come out of it. And you see now 1010, it gives a much better fit than with what we got from our PCA reconstruction before, which always underestimated this a bit. So, we made quite some progress here. Eight, seven, nine, fourteen. That's the homework. I have no clue. I guess it has something to do with the, with the 10 to the minus 4 addition. It could also be that for other genes it overestimates it. So we would, that was the first thing we would check. Does it always underestimate or does it overestimate for other genes and under? Because it should. So. And now we get this, and the question is now what happens if we use this data? And that's what I've done here. You see, I've saved, I've saved this data here as a result of, I call this the GLM PCA, because it's like a PCA, but following the logic of a generalized linear model. Actually, I don't call it Towns quality like that. There's a paper of a couple of years ago which was just doing that. Um, and if I use this, then I get here, this picture here. And um, if we compare this with a normal PCA, here we have a normal PCA, here we have a GLM PCA, it doesn't make that much of a difference. We can also now, this is the normal PCA against pseudotime, and this is now with GLM PCA against pseudotime. You see it now really nicely fit, follows the, nub, the line, which makes sense because the line has already been fitted with a GLM-like procedure. Only at the end something strange happens. And as I said, this end is a bit strange to me. Um, one thing 
which we might want to think is when we uh, should we we have fed if we look into this now what we've done here is we went into it into our y hat we went with a rotation matrix we took the log transformed data rotated it into pca space and back and said this rotating forward and back what should now bring us to something which is a good pca reconstruction this is a bit weird because we are not reconstructing exactly the data we put in because the data put in has this 10 to the minus 4 uh, uh, fudge uh, term and the other data doesn't so it might make sense uh, to use different matrices to rotate in and to rotate back. So that the matrix to rotate in uh, can take care of the 10 to the minus 4 and the rotor index to take back does not do that. And that should give us a slightly better result. It also gives us a computational different thing because then we can understand it as follows, that we say what we're doing here is we have our original data, y full, and then we rotate it into PCA space. So this lives in our high dimensional space R to Vn. And when uh, we uh, rotate it into our PCA space, where we get this PCA dollar X or whatever, and then we rotate it back, and we get again our full matrix or our case and so on, which live, or let's call them the mu's, which also live in the R to the N, and this lives in a smaller space R to the K. So a way how we can understand this is we uh, call this procedure encoding and this procedure decoding. And we say what we are looking for, there is an encoder function and a decoder function, and the encoder function maps from R to the N to R to the K, the decoder function maps from R to the K to R to the N. The encoder function is now tasked with compressing the information. It has much fewer information than available, so it should find some efficient code to describe the cell in the fewer dimensions. And the decoder takes this efficient compressed thing and decodes it and gives us our original stuff back. And our task is now to find two functions, encode and decode, which should do this. Naturally, it seems that the encoder and the decoder function should be inverse to each other. But it might pay off to not enforce this for two reasons. The first reason is that our input and our output is not exactly the same because we use this Poisson loss. So we go in with the normalized data and we come out with the unnormalized data, and it might help to, make, to open up the things. The other thing is that maybe we avoid local minima by letting these functions, uh, by initializing these functions independently with random variables and then see whether they converge to the same thing. And in fact, if you do that, that you make, instead of one tensor R, I make two tensors R1 and R2, it works as well, maybe slightly better. Uh, and if we then multiply the two together, we will get again that they are sort of, um, that, uh, that they are inverse in the sense that if you multiply them, they get sort of turned in identity. Sort of, I mean, because one thing that they can do is there can be a residual rotation in here. It can be that the encoder rotates it projects the matrix in one space, and the decoder then uh, sort of looks from a rotated thing in decoding this. But of course, one of the, so there seems there is some even freedom, some degrees of freedom of rotating in these things, which can observe or can be split between the two. But the point why I'm telling this is um, this gives us a general concept. Namely, so far we said that these two matrices are, these two uh, functions are linear functions because they are described by matrices. If we allow for nonlinear functions, we might get, uh, allow the, uh, the whole construct to be more efficient and to even describe more complicated or more steeply changing changes of uh, matrices while going through state space. 
And maybe the latent space here, which you remember we always use this latent space to get our distances, maybe this latent space actually becomes better if you allow for nonlinear functions in this. That's now a bit the, that's now a bit the question. Uh, partly because that's what Thais and I did in their uh, deep count DCM paper. But I was always wondering whether this was so clever and I wanted to try around a bit. So the bit is I wanted to show you what people have done, uh, what the Thais group have done, but it's something which is in the back of my mind to try out. Can we actually get around that? Valentin and I tried a little bit and noticed that it actually works surprisingly good because my feeling was, yeah, we should get rid. But we will see afterwards that there is actually a remaining issue that we might get rid by, by replacing the log transformation with something more clever. Part of the issue is, of course, that, the, that so. Now, how do we do this? Uh, before I get into how to do the nonlinear function, which I think we'll do next week, I want to show you a bit more about this torch framework by moving now from uh, the GLM PCA to a different way of writing these things with torch so that it looks more like a neural networks. So I start here again, load my data, calculate my fractions and highly variable genes and so on, do all this stuff, calculate here my initial loss, and now I, can, I write here what we've, what we've constructed so far as a network in this torch framework. And torch has this idea of uh, saying uh, that, of defining these network modules where you then have a forward function which does the calculation. And here what I'm using here, and I can have different building blocks and I'm, or they call them modules. And my building block is the linear building block, which is just a matrix. Specifically, a normal linear thing is the function torch linear is a function with a matrix and a vector such that the function applied to a vector x calculates ax plus b where we call A is our matrix and B is the bias vector. In our stuff so far, we didn't have a bias vector. So I replace, so I tell it switch off a bias vector, give me just a naked matrix with nothing. This is why it says here biases. Um, so here encode just means uh, set a function which I call the encoder, which is just a matrix. Namely, a matrix which maps a 1,500-dimensional thing to a 20-dimensional vector, so a 1,500 by 20 matrix. And here in this forward function, I can now write encode y. So getting a data vector y, encode y will multiply this data vector from the right with this matrix. It will expect y to be a vector with 1,500 components and will give out a vector of 20 components which already tells you in this linear, the matrix is subtly transposed. Because, the tor because you know in linear algebra, we always move everything from the right to the left, which is terribly annoying because it feels unnatural. The torch people, because in, te in, uh, in, in, in tensor calculus, we specify any way which things, we turn it around and now we go from left to right and it looks a bit more usable. So this should be read. We go in the 1500 dimension, come out with 20 and it's linear transformation. When uh, I chose 20 because so far we did our PCA always uh, calculating 20 PCA components or 30 actually. This is just my Latin space, and I'm trying around. Actually, we use 30 all the time, I think. So let's stick to 30. So now I'm replacing my PCA, and the PCA was always 30 components. So I do this here, and I want to reconstruct this. Um, our logic with the PCA Y30, our original logic, is that we said um, the state space is 30-dimensional, uh, the state space 
it shouldn't matter whether you have 20, 30, or 40 dimensions. We only know that originally we have 1,500 dimensions, and we want to get rid of the vast majority of it because we assume the trailing 1,200, 1,300 dimensions probably just collect noise, and the early 50 or 100 dimensions. So anything between at least 20 and at most 500 dimensions should probably be fine so that we catch the signal. And because the interesting signal is probably in the first 20, 30, 40 dimensions, and the trailing 1500 or so are probably all noise, and in between is something. If you remember what we had here, where we had our, uh, where was it? Uh, Yes. Yeah, exactly. This was our explained variance, and as you can see, the first 10 components really capture a lot of variance. Whether we now add 20 or 30, hopefully it doesn't make that much of a difference, but it, it's worth trying that. So my feeling is usually I always take 30 because 40 takes too long. Uh, no, we originally in this original Sora tutorial they did this. So they suggested to look at this so-called scree plot and find the angle point and then look at this and say, okay, let's take this here. This turns out to be a bad idea because if you have a rare cell population which only maybe makes up 5% uh, of the cells, uh, the stuff which take, makes out this rare cell population will be in one of the later PCAs and you will overlook it. So in my experience, it's really, you say, don't take more than 100 because you get already into the realm of picking up Poissonais and don't take less than 30 because you're throwing out signal and where you sit in between shouldn't matter. In principle, you should run your calculation once with maybe 30 and once with 80 and convince yourself that it doesn't make a difference. But it's one of these things that people always try to automatize, and I think one shouldn't, one should do judge this by eye. So, now this is, so this is the same that we've done so far. We're now just written in a different way. Instead of explicitly writing out the matrix vector multiplication, I use this linear model here. And if I run this, I have this class, and the way how you use this now is that you initialize this thing by saying, I want to have such a network. Why does it have a, a small n? It's, it's a class it should have. I want such a network element because network is derived from module. It has a couple of convenience things, like instead of pushing each tensor manually to, to the thing, I just say CUDA and it moves the whole thing to the network. And I can, if I call my optimizer, I just sell say m dot parameters and it collects all the tensors that I put into it and tells uh, the optimizer to watch it. And now we can see here our loop, which is again the same as we had before. We uh, make, we, uh, we take our data matrix Y, run it through the network, so through the two matrix multiplications, calculate the loss, calculate the gradient, do an optimizer step, and print our thing. So this is, again, our PCA reconstruction, which after a while brings us back to the PCA. And now we decide, let's switch the whole thing to a Poisson, likely to a Poisson loss. So I've written here my Poisson loss formula as k times storage log mu minus mu. And the mean of that, I move now the k away, the counts and the totals also with CUDA to this GPU. And I am again making my network run the same loop, only this time I've replaced my loss function by this Poisson loss function that I've defined here. And if I do this, then we get the stuff that we've just done at the end. Nearly what we've done before, the one thing I've changed now is that I now actually have made two matrices, one encoding and one decoding matrix. And if I run these two, I can afterwards multiply them to check whether they give the identity or not. And probably they won't quite give the identity because now I go in with something slightly different than what I come out with. So uh, 10,000, no, I don't want to wait till 10,000. And I look here at the scatter plot. And yes, and 
uh, look at this thing and what have I done here? Um, ah, it's still encoder, decoder, uh, encode and decode. This is the same as we just had. Then I wondered maybe instead of using a Poisson loss, I should use a negative binomial loss. So I went through the work of switching here from the Poisson to the negative binomial and calculating the logarithm of this thing here, which turns out to look like this here. And you rerun the same loop as before, this time using the negative binomial loss. And for the dispersion theta, I just fixed the number. Let's use what we've done before, 1 over 0.3 uh, squared. And why would, might it help to use a negative binomial loss instead of a Poisson loss? Because with Poisson loss, starts getting, putting unreasonable precision demands for the highly expressed genes. If you have a highly expressed genes with 1,000 counts and the autoencoder predicts 1,010 counts, this will be considered a huge Poisson deviance because uh, the Poisson distribution is so narrow for high counts. And when our autoencoder will put all its loss on trying to get the highly expressed genes right, but we actually don't want it to, to split its efforts between the highly and the lowly. So I tell it up to 30% deviation is fine. And with that, now I get a new thing. So this basically is over dispersion. This is the, yes, this is the over dispersion, exactly. And when I get this thing. And now here we see the last thing, which of course we are approaching noon, so we will look at this in detail next time, which we can also look at it later. I want to um, now have a nonlinear function instead of allowing in my module here, you see my encoder is a linear function, my decoder is a linear function. And now I want a nonlinear function. And the simplest nonlinear function that people use in the neural network fields is the following. We take a matrix, We take a first, we take a, uh, a linear function, FL1 of x, which is some matrix A1 of x plus some bias vector B1. We make some function FL2 of x, which is some other matrix, plus B2. And now I might say, okay, let's do FL2 after FL1 and apply this to x. Uh, that's, is this a nonlinear function? Obviously not, because I concatenated two linear functions, so it will be linear again, and actually all I get is a contraction here. What instead, or actually it's an affine function because I have this, uh, this bias vector. What I now put in between is something called ReLU uh, x, which is defined as maximum 0, comma, x. So the ReLU function, let's just draw it like this, x is this function. For positive numbers, it's just the identity. For negative numbers, it's constant 0. And if I put this thing in between, F2 after ReLU, after F1, now I have a, a nonlinear function. On the first hand, it might say, does this really cross a lot of nonlinearity? Do we actually uh, um, enlarge functional space. Because if you imagine this matrix here has, let's say, this has n1 parameters. So maybe this is, this is a 100 by 100, 100 by 20 matrix, and this is a 20-dimensional vector. So overall, that's 100 times 20 plus 20 is then a 
200 something. So let's say we have a total of n1 parameters if we add up the number of elements of this matrix and of this vector. And this is an n2 element. And uh, the function space of this total thing nominally should be n1 plus n2 dimensional. And, uh, but uh, de facto without this ReLU, I know that it isn't n1 plus n2 dimensional because I can add, multiply out the two things and the function space becomes much smaller than it seems to be. So my parameter space is larger than the functional space. With the ReLU, uh, the claim is now that the actual function space is effectively as large as n1 plus n2. This simple nonlinearity uh, uh, prevents the function space from collapsing. And there was one of, uh, of the really surprising discoveries that ended the so-called AI winter. So you might know historically these ideas were developed in the 60s. And nobody really managed to get something useful to work. And then in the 19, in the late 1990s or early 2000s, probably neural networks were taken out again from uh, having been forgotten for a whole generation of computer science research. And people did all kinds of useful stuff with that. And there were two uh, major discoveries which caused this renaissance of neural network technology. The one, and arguably the more important, was the discovery that the whole neural network idea was good enough, but that in order to get really spectacular results, it's not enough to concatenate two or three of these things, but you need to concatenate six or seven. So people call these things a layer and say this is a two-layer network. And they said we have to go deep. We have need networks with 10 layers or so to get good stuff. And the other question is what nonlinearity do you put between the layers? And in the 60s, people mainly thought naturally that the best nonlinearity might be a sigmoid, something like this here. Uh, because they felt inspired by actual neurons and said, well, a neuron integrates incoming signals from all its connected neurons, adds them up, and then it goes, and then it, if it goes above a threshold, it fires. But the neuron being a biological thing cannot fire arbitrarily large things, so it will go onto saturation. So they naturally used this as their nonlinearity, while this thing here, it doesn't saturate. It turns out that the saturation is actually something which makes your life very difficult. Because as you've seen, for our optimization, we do gradient descent. So we calculate the gradient. And the gradient will pull by a chain rule through all these things. And if you're sitting here, if, once you, if you ever get into the saturation of your neuron, then uh, the gradient here will be zero, which zeroes out all the other gradients in your chain or you have what's called the vanishing gradients problem, that the gradients are always too small and you take ages of small steps to go over. And hence the idea of keeping with this thing, hence ensuring that the gradient stays, uh, that the gradient uh, um, stays there no matter how far out you get, that really helped uh, tremendously and was one of the crucial ideas in this AI renaissance. And the other point is that, that uh, here, um, that uh, still staying here completely zero doesn't hurt. And so this is what we can now use. And hence, that's what I've shown you here. Uh, I had here my encoder is just a linear thing, and then in the next thing I say the encoder is linear not directly from 1500 to 20, but in two steps, first from 1500 to 200, then this thing, the ReLU, and then a second linear thing from 200 to 20. And as you see, I've removed the, uh, the bias is false, so now my bias is true i.e. I can uh, add it again. Oh, by the way, here I already put a BIOS is true. 
Why? Because you remember we have to add the gene means. And I thought instead of adding the gene means uh, manually, I let the network find the gene means by having this. So this is where we continue next time and try out how much this helps us to switch this thing in. And then we will notice why we have to sneak in this batch norm. But this network that we see here is essentially the so-called deep count autoencoder that the Thais lab uh, suggested a couple of years ago. And uh, that it works really well to denoise our data, as we will see next time. And in that way, uh, yeah. Yep. Questions about this so far? And yeah, here he is. Okay, then I see you all next week on Monday morning. And then we'll see. Finish recording.